Well, good morning, church. I hope you're all doing well. It is a beautiful day to worship together, so we're going to stand and lift high the name of the Lord.
Our scripture this morning is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God, ab God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your great love, which you so beautifully displayed on the cross of Calvary. Lord, that there you showed us the beauty of of your grace and your mercy and your goodness and your love, that you crush your own son on our behalf. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that we can gather now as your people, redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, and we can stand together and sing and worship and honor you as only you deserve. We pray for this time that you would be glorified, that we would set our hearts and our minds solely on you, we pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship together.
thank you for your great love for us. Father, we thank you for your salvation that you have graciously bestowed upon us, your people. We thank you for the strength that you give us each moment to fight our sin and to live in the new life that we have in Christ. We pray for this time, Lord, that as you speak to us through your word, help us push aside the distractions and focus in on the joys that we have in you. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. The words the Holy Spirit would call our attention to this morning come from Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 31. We'll look at verses 31 through 33. If you'll find that verse, I think there's great value in reading from the pages of Holy Writ, as it's called. Some of you are looking on your phones, that's fine, but I'm a dinosaur on these things. I like the pages of Holy Scripture. Ephesians 5, verse 31, as you're finding it. A large part of our problem today as Christians is that we are a spiritual people, but we live in an unspiritual world. And that unspiritual world tends to create in us certain predispositions. And the Scripture uh, corrects those predispositions. One of those is the institution of marriage, and within that institution, specifically the husband's God-given role and responsibility. It is to that that we turn our attention this morning, and the Holy Spirit comes to us in verse 31 and says these words, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Would you pray with me briefly? Our Heavenly Father, we hear you speaking this morning to husbands, but we know through your Spirit that you speak on broader scales than that. You are speaking to young boys who one day will be husbands. You are speaking to wives who you are giving a correct view of the husband's role. You are speaking to young girls and young women who desire to be wives and showing them what kind of husband to be looking for. And most of all, what you are doing, we recognize, is that you are proclaiming your gospel through this symbol called the institution of marriage. And so we pray this morning that you would help us to see spiritual things very clearly and that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and give us the enlightenment that we need on these matters. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul continues speaking to husbands. We touched on this last week in part one, and this would be part two if you uh, prefer to see it that way. We have discovered earlier that the uh, woman's curse, in part, included an innate desire to rule over her husband. We won't go back into the wife's responsibilities, but that's her curse. Uh, Part of man's curse is that he he has now uh, labor in providing sustenance, and that labor would be much harder. In fact, Genesis 2 verse 19 says, it's by the sweat of your face, men that you would provide sustenance for your families. Naturally, these two curses, the curse in woman and the curse in man, work in concert to destroy the marriage relationship. And that's by design, that's by Satan's design. The more the man works, the less time he has to devote to his wife and home. 
The less time he has to devote to his wife and home, the more control she accumulates in day-to-day affairs, and then it becomes a circular cycle that's very difficult to break. The previous verses, 25 through 30, explained how the Spirit addresses this problem in the husband specifically. The spiritual husband, the Spirit-dwelt husband, will relate to his wife in this way. He will sacrifice of himself to show her love. And so boys and men and young girls and women, that's the husband's role. To make less of himself, to sacrifice of his glory and his desires, and to love his wife as Christ loved the church. The apostle pointed last week to Christ as our model, to his attitude, and to his actions toward his own bride, the church, and now he offers two things, an analogy and a conclusion. And I'd like to look at those two things this morning, an analogy and a conclusion. The analogy is this, verses 31 and 32, that marriage, the institution, is a picture of of the gospel. This spiritual analogy was impossible for the Old Testament saints to, ha- to comprehend. Think about it. The institution of marriage as a picture and a symbol of the gospel. This is one reason, incidentally, why Satan's world system relentlessly attacks the nuclear family unit. A healthy marriage constantly reminds Satan of the very gospel which is in the process of destroying him. See? uh, Therefore, he incites men to corrupt the institution of marriage from every conceivable angle. They redefine marriage. They create policy to penalize marriage, they minimize marriage in society's consciousness. All you have to do is turn on the television and see how marriage is portrayed in movies and on TV. And now Disney has joined in the game. You could just watch Disney and they create confusion over gender and over uh, sex and over marriage and over All of the, what's the goal? The goal, whether they realize it or not, is a master spiritual attack on the nuclear family and specifically on the institution of marriage. That's what's happening spiritually. This master societal construct designed by Satan himself works together to create impressions on the natural man. This is why you'll hear him say things like this. Why marry at all, the natural man says, when I can live with someone and not have all the legal entanglements? You ever heard that before? That's the world speaking. That's the natural man. And from a natural perspective, it rings true, doesn't it? Why would we marry if we can have all of the benefits of marriage without any commitment and any legal entanglements? Well, the reason why is because God has created a sacred, sacrosanct institution called the marriage covenant designed as a symbol of the very gospel itself. And as we'll find, it is a symbol which indicts the natural man and infuriates the chief architect, Satan himself. The world's children don't know these things because they are spiritually discerned. The world's children, Jesus called the devil's children. The world's children are Satan's children. They are reared by him and taught of him and discipled by him. And they don't understand these things, but they play right into them. Their father understands them. And it is this marriage union which is a constant reminder to their father, the devil, of the gospel's redemptive mission. And I'll speak more on that in just a moment, but let me open up the text for you. There's two things that we need to look at this morning within 
this spiritual analogy. The first is one flesh, the one flesh union. You'll find it in verse 31. And then second, we'll address the mystery. But this one flesh union, what does it one flesh mean? Look at verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and become one flesh. What does one flesh mean? Well, go look at every commentary that you can find, and you'll leave that con- commentary unsatisfied. Commentators don't say anything about it. If they say anything at all, it's a gloss over, it's a flyover, but no one drills down on one flesh, and we wonder why. When you go back into uh, Genesis 2.24, we find the first occurrence of one flesh, and it actually carries several connotations. Physically, the two bodies, man and woman, husband and wife more specifically, come together as a perfect fit in sexual union. God designed man and woman that way. But more is going on than mere physical intimacy. One flesh. In Hebrew thought, uh, especially related to Genesis 2.24, the flesh refers not merely to the physical act, but to the whole person, the seat of emotions, the, the will, the volitional will, the mind, the passions, the desires. When Hebrews speak of the word flesh, it incorporates all of these things. They're not talking about skin, although skin is included, but they're talking about the, the, the passions of the flesh. And so uh, emotionally, that's flesh. Emotion is a, a fleshly thing. Emotionally, the husband and wife willingly give a piece of their emotions to one another. And if you're married, you know this is true. You have given away a piece of your emotions to your husband, and your husband has reciprocated that. Psychologically, possessive and pleasure elements are freely given to one another. This is why uh, wives get very jealous if husbands are perceived to be flirting with someone or sweet on another woman. And, and husbands are very jealous too when their wives seem to be uh, uh, seen in, in a, a natural way by another man. They, they have these possessive elements, and that's not unhealthy. That's a, that's a healthy thing. It's a godly jealousy. Why? Because they have become one flesh. They are a part of one another, and that includes psychologically. Both people, husband and wife, in some sense meld together to feel like they possess one another in a healthy way. There are also distinct pleasure elements. Both husband and wife unite together to excite pleasurable feelings and emotions within each other. And it's not merely sexual, although that's included, but it's, it's other pleasurable emotions that are evoked by having that healthy bond with your life partner, husband or wife, whether you're a male or female. And then finally, there's a spiritual union. Sex was created by God to be enjoyed under the right conditions, the marriage covenant and the marriage covenant only. And now we have to specify, what does that mean? It means one man, one woman for life. That's what the marriage covenant is as defined by God. Now, again, the world has created its own definition of marriage and the world says it's a man and a man or a woman and a woman and for long it'll be a man and a dog or a woman and a dog. It'd be anything you want it to be. But God has prescribed it as one man, one woman for life. It's too simple for the sophisticated world to comprehend, isn't it? They want to redefine marriage in every way possible. But we step back and say, why are they doing these things? It's because of the threat that the marriage institution presents to their system. It's a picture of the gospel. Husband and 
wife, when marriage is done rightly, are actually worshiping their Redeemer when they come together in sexual intimacy. It's an act of worship when done rightly. And this one flesh union then has many layers, as you can see. We've just touched on it and peeled back the onion just a little bit. But John MacArthur explains it as the, quote, welding of two people together into one unit, the blending of two minds, the blending of two wills, two sets of emotions, two spirits. It's one flesh union. This is why sexual intercourse is reserved for the marriage bed. It excites and blends mental, emotional, psychological, and the physical makeup of two persons in a way no other action on earth can do. Incidentally, this is also why childhood sexual abuse and Young adult sexual experiences and experimentation will carry forward into adulthood with traumatic effects. Those experiences, whether consensual or not, affect your innermost being in a way that doctors and psychiatrists and psychologists never will comprehend fully. They grope at it, they get very close to the truth, Uh, They recognize that these things carry forward from from, uh, youth or adolescence into adulthood and that you can never uh, quite unsee or unforget uh, or forget the things that have happened to you. But, But they haven't recognized that these are spiritual and they haven't recognized the importance of the one union concept that God has laid forth in these scriptures. So you can overcome those things, sexual abuse or promiscuity in your younger years, but they leave corrupt, indelible impressions that can affect your entire person for the rest of your life. This is why the Apostle Paul warns against prostitution and premarital sex in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 13 through 18. They affect the one flesh union. And let me just say there's young people all over the place in here if you're not married. Save yourself a lot of heartache and pain and save yourself for your future spouse. Practice abstinence. Tell boys no and boys don't violate young girls by doing these things you are leaving impressions that will carry forward the rest of your life you one day will marry and in your marriage counseling you will come to me or someone else and you will have to go incident by incident through every one of those indiscretions save yourself the embarrassment now commit yourself to the Lord Put away fleshly sexual perversions and save yourself for the one whom God is raising up for you even as we speak. Here's what Paul's saying. There is a grafting element embedded in this one flesh union. The whole person... Let's take the wife, her whole person emotionally, experientially, psychologically, spiritually is grafted into her husband and vice versa. His whole person is grafted into her. Jesus spoke of these things spiritually when he said in John 15 verses 5 and 6, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. You see what Jesus is saying, there is a spiritual sense in which he has come into us and we have come into him and we are growing in Christ's likeness in that way. And the same principle applies, there is a certain sense in which the husband and the wife have been grafted together, one flesh, and they are growing into one another more and more as the years go by. And that's the one flesh union. 
And that's why it's so difficult when a spouse passes away. The void, the emptiness, the not knowing what to do. If you don't feel that, then your one flesh union was not very cemented. If you do feel that, that's very healthy. That's a good thing. That means that you were intertwined and grafted with your spouse in such a way that it was so tight that it hurt when that bond was, was taken away. And so it's one union. Maybe we'll write that down and it will become its own commentary because no one else told me these things. The next thing is the spiritual mystery in verse 32. He says, this mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. This one flesh union, so profound, it is referring to Christ and the church. When we go back to the Garden of Eden, we realize that Adam and Eve's first marriage was a physical copy, a shadow that pointed to the spiritual union of Jesus Christ and His bride, the church. Adam and Eve corrupted that union by reversing roles and destroyed society as we know it. Yet, the marriage institution still stands today as a symbol which points mankind, if he's willing to listen, to the ultimate fulfillment of marriage, Christ and His bride coming together in a one flesh union, if you will. And if mankind is not willing to listen, that symbol becomes yet another indictment on his sinful, selfish soul. We wonder how many people will stand before the judgment throne of Christ or the judgment throne of God. And God will point and said, I gave the institution of marriage to point you to the marriage of Christ and his bride, the church, but you were unwilling to see it. In fact, you didn't want to see it. You wanted to destroy it. You wanted to pervert it. You wanted to undermine it and corrupt it because you wanted what you wanted. And you see how the symbol of marriage becomes an indictment on the sinful, selfish soul of man. And I'm I'm almost certain that conversation will take place at the judgment throne of God because God has rooted the institution of marriage in the very gospel itself. Why don't I hear this? I almost said at funerals. Why don't I hear this at weddings? No one talks about this. We talk about the earthly and this person met this person. No one talks about these things. They're spiritual And they're deep. They're deep. And they will ground your marriage in the very gospel itself if you understand them rightly. So you have this spiritual analogy. I hope I haven't lost you along the way. If I have, Paul brings us all back on point in verse 33, and he makes a concluding remark. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Paul had gotten sidetracked with this spiritual theological reflection, but he comes back to the issue at hand, an issue he began in verse 25, self-sacrificial love. If you go back to that 25th verse, he talks about agape love, and that carries forward through all the way through verse 33, actually, uh, talking about husbands sacrificing of yourself for your wife. Now, Paul has added something here for the wife, too. I missed this up until this week. When I was studying it initially, I I missed it altogether. My mind was on other things. But this week, I, I saw this little phrase, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Wives, you are willingly and lovingly to submit to your husband. We found that out in verse 22. But here it says that you are also to respect him. It's a different word. And why is it that we hear sermons about wives submitting to husbands, but we never hear any about wives respecting their husband? 
The word there is phobetai in Greek. It comes from the word phobia. It means fear. It's the literal meaning of the word. If you track that word and how it's used in the New Testament, what you will find that is that it doesn't mean uh, to be afraid of your husband or to be frightened of your husband. It doesn't mean that at all. It means uh, to adore him, to reverence him, to honor him, to treat him as worthy. It's a fear in a sense of awe and respect. You say, well, what is that supposed to mean? Because all of society tells me that I need to pr protect myself against my husband, not to honor, respect, and stand in awe of him. Well, remember, we're in the illustration of Christ and his bride, right? And so the apostle is making a conclusion, not that you treat your husband like Christ, you don't worship him, God, no. What he's saying is you are to respect him as a grace gift to stand in awe that God would gift him unto you of all creatures and that you would lift him up and that you would honor him and that you would respect him and that, yes, that you would come up under his leadership in willing submission to him. That's what it means and so we ask wives everywhere to come up under the leadership of your husband and to treat him right. You'll be surprised how much better he'll act. But you see what Paul's doing. It's one thing to submit while your heart is frowning about it, and it's quite another thing to submit and to enjoy it. And that's what he's getting at. The two need to be in alignment for this all to work. Well, Paul here is showing how Christ's new society is to function differently from the world's society, uh, and he's showing it for a purpose. Now, when we step back, we've, we've gone from verse 25 all the way down to verse 33. We step back and say, what's happening here? What's really going on? What, what is the meaning that Paul is after? He's showing this, the institution of marriage, rightly portrayed, serves to redeem society from its sin curse. He's dealt with the woman's curse, he's dealt with the man's curse, and he showed how redemption can reverse the curse. This happens as individuals are redeemed, of course, but it also happens as husbands and wives live out redeemed marriages. I don't know that we realize the implications of this on society at large. You see, the institution of godly marriages has a redeeming effect on society, and Satan hates it. He hates it. He hates it. Every time he sees a godly marriage, he hates it because it is reminding him that the gospel will destroy him, and he seeks with all of his might to tear up that marriage, to, to break that marriage, to create conflict within that marriage. He does everything he can mentally, emotionally, financially to ruin every marriage he can and to corrupt the very institution of marriage itself. He uses politicians to, to undermine it. He uses depraved people to redefine it. He uses the societal construct to minimize it. I, I can't think of a television or movie that rightly portrays a godly gospel-centered marriage. And if the Bible is mentioned at all, it's only mentioned in a derogatory fashion. Oh, they're the religious fanatics, the weirdos. We should expect nothing less from society. What is this? It's an attempt to undermine the institutions that God has put in place to remind people of their sinfulness and of the Savior who can redeem them from it. How many marriages, we wonder, have been destroyed because of the husband's selfish ambitions for more money, more prestige, more career advancement. We mentioned it last week, the husband isn't sacrificing of himself 
by working all of these hours. He's sacrificing his wife for himself. He convinces himself that he's noble. I've talked with many of you. When your life has fallen apart and you were working 70, 80 hours a week, what would you expect? What would you expect? He convinces himself he's working tirelessly to set up his children and grandchildren with generational wealth and with opportunities. But there, that is a mindset steeped in Satan's world system. That's what he wants you to think. Instead, and in reality, the husband is sacrificing everything for his own glory. Because in the end, he does more damage to the very people he convinces himself he's helping And he gives them the tools by which they can destroy themselves. In large part, what Paul is really uh, declaring an indictment against is, is materialism here. Because it's materialism that causes us to neglect our wives in the first place and to not sacrifice for them and to convince ourselves we're sacrificing for them when we're in reality sacrificing for our own selves. And you say, well, you're talking crazy talk. Well, I, said, I told you, the natural man cannot comprehend these things. These are spiritually discerned. And he who has spiritual ears understands exactly what I'm talking about. What has the natural husband accomplished? What has the unspiritual husband accomplished? When the marriage is destroyed, what is the impact on the children? What is the impact on the next generation's view of marriage? Husband, when you're yelling at your wife, your children are listening. What image is that shaping in their mind about God's institution of marriage? When you're ordering your wife around, and you're taking Bible verses and beating her over the head with them, what are your children, uh, what images are they conjuring up about God's institution of marriage? Corrupt ones. How will that impact the church, her witness and the Great Commission? How will that serve to undo the curse under which society operates? To speak nothing of the generational curse you're handing down to your children and to your children's children. You see, this is deep. This is deep reaching. No, the, the spiritual husband, the spiritual husband will sacrifice of himself, not for himself. And when many of them do this together... What happens is the gospel spreads more rapidly, even if his paycheck doesn't. You catch my drift? You see what I'm getting at? You see what Paul's saying here? We are more concerned for our wives and our children's material well-being than we are for their spiritual well-being. And that must stop. When you sacrifice of yourself, your dreams, your aspirations, your promotions, your influence, your prestige, then the marriage will be healthier. I had someone approach me after the sermon last week, and he said, I had a job opportunity, and the money would have been great. It would have been an advancement. But after listening to that, I think the more time at home with my wife and my child are eternally of greater value than the paycheck would be. And he has accurately, spiritually deciphered Paul's text here. He is absolutely right. Whether he has money or not, whether his children go to college or not, your wife, husband, will submit more and more if you love her with that type of self-sacrificial love. Your children will experience a more stable environment, which is far more valuable than a financial inheritance. Christ will begin using healthier family units to create healthier congregations such as this one, so that the gospel moves more fluidly throughout the earth. 
And it must be so. That I'm not giving opinions or opining here. It must be so. I declare it to be so under the authority of God's Word because the marriage institution as declared by God, is rooted in the gospel, verse 23, is memorialized in the gospel, verse 25, and points unregenerate mankind to the gospel, verse 32. So this is not opinion. This is declaration, proclamation. This is truth. And it even runs deeper than that. These, uh, we've just looked at earthly ramifications here. Let me just open up some, some cosmic ramifications, and then I'll leave you to, to think those out on your own. Satan brought a curse upon Adam's race, the human race, and the marriage institution in the Garden of Eden. Think with me about this. The angelic beings, both righteous and wicked ones, witnessed that ruination in the garden. They were there. They saw it. Yet God promised, even then, a Redeemer who would restore all things. Genesis 3, verse 15. Even in that ruination, God offered a, a, a hope of grace. And according to Colossians 1, verse 20, which we'll look at in a few months, Jesus Christ is the Redeemer, we know that, and He is currently reconciling all things unto Himself. That text says, whether on earth or in heaven or even under the earth, all things includes the marriage institution, no matter what Satan's society does with it, no matter how they corrupt it and redefine it. Jesus Christ is reconciling the marriage institution under His self, under its original design, and in its perfect form as given in the Garden of Eden. Husbands, Christ is restoring your role in the marriage as He regenerates and sanctifies your heart. As you fulfill your role, think about this, as you fulfill your role, righteous angels who witness the original fall and disgrace gaze down upon you and they worship God because they see God's promise being fulfilled in your husbandly obedience. When you do the right thing, angels in heaven worship God and that ought to please you. That ought to make you enjoy sacrificing of yourself for your wife. And the opposite is, is also true. The fallen angels who also were there and saw the original ruin and disgrace, they wince when they see you being an obedient husband, when they see you being a, a, a selfless husband. They writhe in anguish. They gnash their teeth at that same spiritual sight because it is a constant reminder you were created a little lower than them and yet you are doing things a cursed man should never do. But a redeemed man will do. And you are showing them that their end is near. That the redemption is flowing. And that Christ is reconciling all things unto Himself. I'll leave generational curses alone for now, but I'll only say this. You don't realize the generational impact an unspiritual husband will have on his children and grandchildren. No, it's my relationship between me and my wife and it ends there, he says. And we say, no, it is not. It has generational spiritual effects that will flow down to your children and your children's children for generations. God can break those generational curses. But some of you are under those curses even now. And it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the decisions that, that your forefather made in his marriage relationship and his marriage institution that have flowed down to you. Praise God that Jesus Christ redeems those curses, but maybe you are operating under that curse even now. You need Christ. You need the Spirit. 
You need to fling yourself at the foot of the cross and beg Him to save you, to give you His Spirit, to circumcise your heart, and to redeem you so that the curse can be broken. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, when husbands will become spiritual and fulfill their husbandly duties, the gospel will flow more freely when marriages are healthy and happy. Less concerns, less stress, less frustration, less angst, so that you can throw all of your energies toward the gospel's advancement rather than your own personal advancement. And all it requires, husbands, is that you sacrifice, that we sacrifice of ourselves and not for ourselves. If you won't do it for her, at least do it for the sake of the gospel. At least do it for the sake of the gospel. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And I say no more. Let's pray. Father, we...